together growing in faith changing communities dear friends welcome back to our channel uh, to the women in the scriptures series today i would like us to look at an interesting character it is potiphar's wife which is found in the book of genesis chapter 39 now this woman is known by her relationship to her husband she is known as the wife of Potiphar so it is in chapter 39 of Genesis chapter 1 when Joseph was taken down to Egypt a certain Egyptian Potiphar a courtier of Pharaoh and his chief steward bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there there are few things that are important the first one while my main focus is on this a woman on this female character uh, she is flanked by two male characters the first one being her husband the second one being Joseph and these two characters to a large degree redefine who this woman is we do not necessarily know her name we do not know much about her a chapter is only given to her and coincidentally this chapter is given to her in relationship to Joseph that is important to to realize that on her own she does not have a chapter but we are told of her because of Joseph who was sold by his own brothers the other thing that is also important let's go back and redefine who Potiphar is we know that Potiphar is a courtier, uh, he is a chief steward in the palace of Pharaoh. But also other people will translate the word Saris in Hebrew, they will translate that and call him a eunuch. And if he's known as a eunuch, then it has quite an interesting significance for us. And I take the same interpretation that Potiphar is not just a chief steward, he is a eunuch. Uh, he is sterile. He's been made that way probably by Pharaoh because he's going to be working in the palace and no man should be working in the palace and he shouldn't be doing anything to any females that are there in the palace of Pharaoh. So that's why he's probably sterile or important or whatever the case is, but he is incapable of doing any sexual favors to any woman does that shock you well it should because if this man cannot do any sexual relations sexual intercourse or what whatsoever with any woman in the house of pharaoh he's been made that way how come then he has a wife many people would argue that it, it is possible that he was not always like this. It is possible that he was not always sterile. He was not always a eunuch. Now, it is possible that he had married his wife while everything was okay. Now, because of his position in the house of Pharaoh, he had to change. Now, if that is true, did he consult his wife? Did she say yes to that was she okay with that but doesn't this also happen in marriages even today when one person pulls in this direction the other one pulls opposite direction when one person only thinks of himself or herself without consulting the other person without asking the other person to ask what is your opinion in what i'm about to do what is your opinion in what I think the Lord is calling me and inviting me to be doing in my own life? Because I am no longer just me and myself and my thoughts. We are now together. We are now a couple. How do I move from me to us? How do I move from mine to ours? How do we move to this individualism to a community of everything? How do we try to sing in unison how do we try to work together as a couple without the other one feeling oppressed or left out how do you deal with someone in a relationship 
who always thinks of himself or herself. And yet the decisions they make affect you. How many of our couples have struggled financially because one other couple has decided to spend the money as they wish without even thinking and considering that my actions are going to impact negatively on someone else's life. And so that's the background in which we should somehow read the story of Potiphar and his wife. The second problem that I also find in here, if you go to chapter 39 verse 4, Potiphar took a liking to Joseph and made him his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his household and entrusted to him all his possessions. What is the role of Joseph in the house? He has been put in charge of the household. He has also been put in charge of the possessions. You remember when I started the series and I spoke about Sarah and I spoke about how Sarah, well, well, when Abraham pretended and wanted Sarah to pretend to be his sister and how I spoke about Abraham leaving and how somehow in the Hebrew Bible, the so-called Old Testament, somehow women were seen as possessions and now Joseph is in charge of the household in charge of a possession of Potiphar. Where, where, is, where is the wife here? Is she part of the possession? If not, was she not the house, did not the house belong to her? Was she not the manager or the manageress in the house? Was she not running everything? If she was running everything while Potiphar was busy in the palace, now the coming of Joseph has it taken away those responsibilities from her? How is she reacting to this? I used to manage everything in here. I used to do everything in here. And all of a sudden, someone else comes in and takes my job, takes my responsibilities, takes what I've been doing all these years. Potiphar took a liking into Joseph. What is Potiphar's thinking about Joseph? Now, the scriptures tells us in verse 5, the Lord blessed the Egyptians' household because of Joseph's sake. In fact, the, Lord, the Lord's blessing was on everything that he owned, both inside the house and outside the house. So Joseph is a, is a beautiful bait for the success of Potiphar. As long as Potiphar had Joseph, everything seemed to be going well in his life. Well, can we say everything? Wait till you find the problem. But before we get there, let's go to verse 6b. Now, Joseph was strikingly handsome in countenance and in body. He must have been a fine looking young man. Is Potiphar aware that his wife is not at peace with him being a eunuch? If he is aware, and if the wife, the wife is vocal and she talks about these things, she probably would have told him, I didn't ask for you to go and work in the house of Pharaoh. I didn't ask for you to become a eunuch. I didn't ask for you to be sterile. I didn't ask for you to be important. Now, if he knew all those things, why would he bring a strikingly handsome young man? What was his plans? What is he doing? Why, why would he bring that into his household? And this goes into our own lives. I know my own weaknesses. I own my own flaws. I, own my own, I know my own sinfulness. But why do I expose myself to things that I know I have no power over? Why do I expose myself to things that I know I have no control over? Why do I do the same to someone else? It's like I'm asking a struggling alcoholic and I say to him, go and be a bartender. Why would I do that? And so we need to know our strengths and our weaknesses. 
and we need to be bargaining with ourselves. And, and sometimes we are very strong, but are we that strong? Lord, lead us not into temptation. And this is an important prayer. It is an important sight. We cannot overlook this sight in, 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 in Potiphar's actions. Why did he bring Joseph into the house? Knowing very well that he fails in satisfying his wife in all these marital matters. Let's look then, dear friends, and in verse 7. After a time, his master's wife began to look fondly at Joseph and said to him, lie with me. But he refused. As long as I am here, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, but has entrusted to me all that he owns. He wills no more authority in this house than I do. And he has withheld from me nothing but yourself, since you are his wife. How then could I commit so great a wrong and thus stand and, condemn, and be condemned before God? Although she tried to entice him day after day, he will not agree to lie beside her and even stay near her. He tried to run away. She tried to pursue him. Let us not make a moral judgment. It's easy to make a moral judgment. But my interpretation in here ask of me, let us go to the text and try and see this from as many angles as we could. She was not satisfied as a wife. She had taken a liking to Joseph. She asked him to lie with her because she wants to be with him. Even though she's married and she's fully aware that what she's asking of Joseph is wrong. She's fully aware what she's asking of herself, of her husband, is betrayal. But why does she do that which she does? And that's an important question I always ask myself and I ask people to ask themselves as well. Why do we do the things that we do? Because unless we know the reasons why we do that which we do, we will never really solve the problem. We will always be dealing with symptoms. And so in here, we need to move away from just focusing on symptoms and go to the root cause and ask ourselves, what happened to this woman. I don't think she was a cheap person. I don't think that she was an immoral person. But certain things had happened to her that she wanted to satisfy herself at the expense of truth and higher values. Now, if we were to put her against Joseph, Joseph comes out as a hero. He comes out as a great guy who refuses and who withstands temptation like anything else. But what fascinates me is her persistence. She persists day after day. That's what the scripture says to us. She says day after day she kept on asking. Now, if Potiphar came home every day, how did she look at him? If Joseph came to serve them dinner, how did she look at Potiphar in the presence of Joseph? How did she look at Joseph in the presence of Potiphar? Look at the, 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 the internal turmoil, the struggle. She knows what she wants to do. She knows what she cannot do. Go back to what St. Paul says. I find myself doing things that I don't want to do. And the things that I do want to do, I cannot do. The other one is that I find myself doing things that I know I shouldn't be doing. I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm doing it. I'm entertaining such thoughts in my mind, I shouldn't. I'm going to these places, I shouldn't. I'm cracking open this bottle, I shouldn't. 
I'm putting my hand in, in, a, in a cookie jar. I shouldn't. The mind knows what is right, but the heart knows something else. How many people live in things, in relationships that are toxic? That they know in themselves, I should not be here. I should not be doing this. But unfortunately, something else does it. And so there's this imbalance in our lives. The, the, the desires and the realities are too different. It's something that strikes me that happens here. In verse 11, one such day when Joseph came into the house to do his work and none of the household servants were there, she laid hold of him by his cloak, saying, lie with me. But leaving the cloak in her hand, he got away from her and ran outside. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and fled outside, she screamed for her household servants and told them, Look, my husband has brought in a Hebrew slave to make spot of us. He came in here to lie with me, but I cried out as loud as I could. When you heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran away outside. There's nothing as dangerous than a vengeful woman. She did not get what she wanted. And now she's out to destroy Joseph. We know from the scriptures the text tells us that she initiates it. She says to him, lie with me. And Joseph refused. And she holds on to Joseph and Joseph runs away and the cloak is left behind. So Joseph probably runs outside naked. And she knows that she's now caught and she cries and she says, I've been raped and he wanted to rape me. I'm the victim. And Joseph has no one to defend him. And that's what I want to talk about. She has become a bitter woman. Now, in psychology, there is a principle that says victims, unless they are helped, they are most likely to become perpetrators. Now, this woman has shown so much bitterness, anger, towards Joseph. She's out there to destroy him. Now, how many of our sisters have fallen victim of that? Were they themselves, because probably of the past hurts, because of everything that has gone to them, they hate men. They want nothing to do with men. They tell you to your face, I don't want anything to do with men. And so they are radically against men. I have absolutely great love and respect for fem feminism. But there's danger when I become an extremist in anything. Where I judge a person by his gender or by her gender. I no longer see you as a person. My past experiences of this gender black, uh, what, it closes me, it blocks my image and my thinking and I see you as my father. I see you as my ex-husband. I see you as the rapist. That's not how life is all about. In as much as there's so much evil going on in the world, but there are still good men and good women. And what frustrates me is that she goes out of her way to destroy this man. I am not denying the fact that quite a number of people have been raped, both by men and women. But I also know the other fact, that there are some people who are in jail today, they have not committed those crimes. There are some men who have become victims of an angry bitter woman. 
And so from the story of Potiphar's wife, one is able to appreciate the struggles, but at the same time, one is also able to be made aware that I need some sort of healing so that I don't become the perpetrator. I don't become that which I hate the most. And that is what we find with this bitter lady. She becomes so angry that she goes out to destroy Joseph. And we know the story. Potiphar comes in back into the house and he chucks Joseph out and they throw him into prison. Let's look into our own lives and ask for the grace of God. May the Queen of Heaven pray for healing in our lives, in our hearts, that we may learn to forgive ourselves, we may learn to forgive those who've harmed us and refuse to become victims forever and become healers of the past. May Almighty God bless us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.